be about three seconds. Yep. Right, we're live. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, good afternoon, boys. I hope you've had a good week. Um, first thing, Mr. Ferguson, uh, he can't be with us this afternoon. He's in another meeting. Um, so he just wanted to pass on um, his hopes that all's going well in your homes and you're very safe and well. Um, and we continue to hear some really good feedback from your teachers about online learning and um, the fact that you're, yeah, despite it being a little bit tough, you're getting on with it and um, it's really good to hear. So keep that up. Um, we're hoping for some good news on Monday, but we'll see what happens um, from there. But a message from Mr. Ferguson is he hopes you're all well. It's a shame he can't be with you today and he wishes you and your families a safe and happy weekend and then we go again on on Monday morning so well done for all of you that are in every lesson working hard that's excellent um, and that's about it from from us really in, in terms of what we want to talk about from a school because um, we are very fortunate to have Michael Brick with us today um, you'll know him as someone who is an Olympic gold medalist you'll have seen him on the podium in Tokyo very very recently um, and you'll have seen him with that Olympic gold around his neck. But we know him as a, a Westlaker as well. We know him as someone who left our school in 2012. He had a very successful rowing career with us at, at Westlake. And we are very fortunate to have him back today. One thing um, I do want to mention before we bring Michael on. Gold medal or not, um, Michael is someone who we really respect. He's a great old boy ever since he left the school and continues to do, he gives up his time, he's heavily involved with the rowing community um, and that epitomises everything we want from our Westlakers. So that is awesome that he's willing to do that and fit that around his corporate speaking, his studying, being a full-time athlete, being an Olympic champion, he always comes back um, and he always does his bit for the school. So that's something I want to get out from the start. Um, but I actually think that's probably enough, Mike. That's probably enough from me. Um, the boys are all here to hear from you. So Tim, I think if we can get him on live now, if we can zoom him in, that would be awesome. And we'll start our little um, our little interview. Cool. Mike, you're live. There you go. The boys can, uh, they've stopped seeing me now and they can see you. So that's probably um, what they're all here for, which is great. Um, and I suppose, Mike, it's a thank you. Um, you know, you, you're very busy at the moment. I don't suppose training stops just because you're in a lockdown. You're still working pretty hard and it's great you've given up your time, so thank you. Um, and I think we probably want to start with what everyone wants to see, which is, have you got the gold medal with you? I do, Andrew, I do, yeah. So here it is here. And hey, while I'm showing that around, um, thanks for the chance to have a chat. And thanks to you, Andrew, thanks, Tim, thanks, David, for giving me the chance to, to chat with all you guys. Um, this thing weighs 700 grams, all you guys are watching, which I know doesn't sound like much, but if you could imagine a kilo or so a one litre milk bottle hanging on a chain around your neck, that's what this weighs. And it's it's made up of uh, recycled phone parts, which is pretty cool. And then it's coated in actual gold, which is which is pretty awesome. Um, they're really cool, the, the medals. They're really cool. I uh, I had it sitting here. I was, I was talking with Andrew and Tim before. I bought something else that I want to show you guys. Um, and that's a couple of pins. One is that. Olympian one that you get when you when you become an Olympian uh, with your number and then one that you should all be relatively familiar with and that's the the Westlake Gold Award which which I hope you all get to look up to in the auditorium and, and dream of maybe achieving something one day that, that earns you that. I was lucky enough to be part of the um, 2012 New Zealand junior crew that went over with Cam Webster from Westlake and a couple of other guys and we we managed to get a gold there, which was awesome. But um, hey, it's awesome that you guys have that on the side of the assembly hall and can see the gold awards and and look up to guys like myself and and Izzy. I know Izzy's not on there, but you t you saw from him recently, and he's another awesome role model. And just that you have those guys to look up to and 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 that we're around and that you can talk to us. Yep, fantastic, uh, Mike. And. I'm not going to put you on the spot and say which gold medal means the most to you, the Westlake one or the Olympic one. That would be just so unfair to do that. But um, what I would like to ask, I mean, you've got the medal. You can you've had it around your neck, but has it really sunk in yet? You know, Olympic champion, something that hasn't happened in a rowing eight since 1972. It's only happened twice in New Zealand history. Yeah. Someone told me yesterday there's less than 100 people, 100 New Zealanders have an Olympic gold medal. I'll have to fact check that one. But really? 
Has it all sunk in? You're an Olympic champion. Um, it has its moments. It has its moments where it does. It's it's kind of a weird one because, like we, yeah, you know, I've got this saying, and it's it's a bit of an alteration from another famous sports person, so I can't take full credit for it. But it's you know, believe you can be the best, but train like you're in second place. Yeah. And you know, with that, like, there's there's definitely these moments where it's like, wow, we did it. Like we we achieved everything that we'd hoped to, which is so much more than a lot of worthy people can say. But yes, we achieved it. But you know, there's always that, you know, part of the mindset that leads to success is always believing that you can do it. So there was always that part of me that was like, I know that I'm worthy of this. One day it's going to happen. And I think that's a really key thing for mindset and achieving something that you, you know, achieving a high goal is having that mindset that you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that can, you know, not everyone here watching is 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 a rower, but I suppose that's something that can transcend rowing yeah. and it can go into, you know, all facets of people's lives, which is a really, a really important thing to to bring up. Thank you for that. Um, but if we could um, just go back to the Olympics and just the lead up to it, I mean, it wasn't really a guarantee that you were going to qualify to even be there in the first place. Could you give us a bit of an insight into what you and the crew had to go through even just to to get qualified to be on the plane to go to Tokyo. Yeah, I mean, just like everyone else, the Olympics was, our journey to the Olympics was so turbulent and so uncertain. Like there was no guarantee that it would go ahead. COVID's, COVID's played a massive part on everyone and, and I won't go into it any any further, but massive part of our journey was dealing with the uncertainty. And we sat down at the start of the season. It was 2000 and August 2020. And we sat there and the Olympics had already been called off. It should have happened at this point. And we sat there as a group of about 13 guys and said, how are we going to go ahead and train our best in the hopes that the Olympics go ahead? Like a lot of athletes and a lot of people, they, they move forward in life thinking about, you know, with their, with their main goal in mind, which is great, it can be motivating, but for us having that at the forefront of our minds meant that we were setting ourselves up for a potentially quite turbulent journey and, and getting news about delays and potential postponements and the Olympics being put off. And we decided that having a focus on something completely outside of our control and something uncertain was not going to be a healthy approach. So what we did was we, yeah, we had some, we, we had a big chat. It was about a three hour meeting. We we're sitting in a boardroom together at Rowing NZ and we decided that we needed to shift our focus from our result. And look, you guys will have heard this a lot, but shift it onto the process and almost put ourselves in the shoes at Tokyo and, you know, jump forward a year and look back and and pretend that the Olympics weren't actually going ahead and go, you know, what is our worst case scenario? And our worst case scenario is we've trained for a year and, and the Olympics are called off. Yep. And so we, we put ourselves there and we thought, what is going to make this journey worth it if we happen, if this happens? And realistically, we didn't actually change anything. We When we look back, we thought, well, look, we've spent a year training with our mates getting staying fit, embracing a, 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 a engaging challenge, you know, and, and getting paid to do it. What is what is wrong with that? Yes, the Olympics getting called off would have been a massive letdown, but far from wasted time. And just that, that subtle mindset shift onto the positives of that situation just meant that day in, day out, we were training so well, man. We just, we just got obsessed with this with this process yep. because we knew that regardless of what happened down the line it was gonna it was gonna hold us in good place yeah yeah and i think that's you know all that work behind the scenes nobody sees it it isn't the really showy stuff it's the hard work and the and the grind that people don't understand i mean they've seen you with an olympic medal around your neck but they haven't seen those countless hours and the hard hard training so it's great to give us an insight of that can we just fast forward a little bit? You know, you're on the plane, you get to Tokyo. Um, can you give us a bit of a, a sense of the emotion of being at the Olympics, what it's like, the village, the, you know, we hear so much about the food and the, yeah. the camaraderie and the, everything that goes on. Could you give us just a, a one minute insight into being 
centrally involved in the Olympic Games? Um, if I could give it one word, it would be energetic. Right. Yeah, like now more than ever, think about you're in one place, you're in a, a, a village. It is a village. You're in a village and it's only one kilometre long and it's just full of high-rise buildings with countries' flags hanging out over the balconies and there's always noise and there's five to 10,000 of the world's best athletes from literally all around the world in one place. Like that is the vibe of the Olympic Games and everyone is there because they want to be there. That's the coolest thing about it. Everyone's passionate, everyone's excited. Like it's just, even in, even with masks on and in COVID, it was just so electric, the atmosphere there. Yeah, brilliant. And then, then obviously, you know, you've got to shift your mindset away from, you're not here just to make up the numbers. You, you're actually mm -hmm. trying to achieve something. And can you talk us through a little bit about, um, and you may have to explain to people just about what a repechage is and how you actually came to be in the final. Because again, if getting to the Olympics was tough, getting to the final was tough yes. as well. So can you give us a bit of a perspective there? Sure. Um, I'll try and cut a long story short. So with rowing at the world champs prior to the Olympics, you qualify your spot at the Olympics. And this is a very long story. I'll try and cut it That's quite okay. short. That's all right. Uh, the men's eight hadn't qualified. And so there was only one more chance to qualify for the Olympics. And that was going through this, this final Olympic qualification regatta, or it's called the regatta of death because <laughs> all of the non-qualified crews go and only two from each event go through. And it's called the regatta of death because you don't get this range of uh, results. You get 10% of the people at that regatta are absolutely over the moon because they've, they've made it, they're going to the Olympics. And 90% of people have failed. You don't get this range in between where you get at other events where people, you know, might be stoked to make an A final and therefore they're happy with their regatta. It's just, it's really binary. You made it or you didn't. And that was what we had to go through. And we had to, four months ago, travel to Europe in the middle of the pandemic and try and get back through the MIQ system, keep our fitness through the MIQ period, and then, you know, go into the Olympics after going through all of that. So, our, yeah, that was just a massive part of our campaign that, came with a lot of uncertainty that was part of our plan to to just get stuck into everything that we could control and nothing else yeah yeah and then it's then it's time to go it's time to make that final you know how's that what's the mood like um you know if you talk us through getting getting into that final how did it go the olympic final or the qualification yeah, one the olympic final yeah um that's a really interesting one because only a couple of weeks before we went to the Olympics, we had a meeting, with, well, we had a meeting, we had a dinner with one of our team sponsors, awesome guy. Um, he's running the, the saliva testing that you guys are probably seeing around New Zealand. He's doing all that, which is quite cool. Um, sorry, side note. Anyway, he he pulled us aside at a, this barbecue that we had and, he, and he's American, so he goes, hey guys, right, so, so I'm gonna do a, a motivational speech for you, but this isn't, I don't usually do this. So, so just bear with me. And you know, he proceeded to deliver the best motivational speech we've ever had. <laughs> and one of the things that he said was, you know, you, you guys need to be loose. You need to go into your race, not being tense, because if you're tense, it's only gonna pull you away from how, you know, from your, your best performance. And, and you know, this isn't just a wrong thing, guys. This, this lesson that he told us, this guy's a, a very successful businessman and this will be something that he's learned in business that also applies to sport and life and the message was that when you're going into that olympic final an olympic gold is not something that you need it's something that you want and you know the two things sound kind of kind of similar but they're actually really different the difference between wanting and needing you know need comes with this this, this tension, you know, you, you, you need to do that because it's going to justify everything and it's going to, you know, it's, it's going to prove your worth and, and yeah, you, you just, you just get so much tension and not only do you get tension prior to, but if you, you know, if you succeed, that's great. But if you fail, that sets you up for quite a lot of, uh, it just, it just won't put you in a good mindset. It will put you in a bad headspace. If you fail at something that you think you need, and so his, his message was rather, you know, the Olympic gold that you've been training towards for the last 12 years isn't something you need, it's something that you want. And don't get me, he's like, he's like don't get me wrong, you want it pretty badly, but yeah. you don't need it. If you don't achieve that, you won't be any less, you won't be any more, you, you know, that does not define your value. It does not define you, but it will 
it will validate all of your training. Yep. Which I thought was an amazing message because you know that can go on to so many things in life. Like you guys are at school at the moment, you've got your exams, and I hope Andrew won't get upset at me for saying this, but you know your exams are something that you want to do well in, but ultimately, you know, if for some reason they they don't go how you you want them to, it it isn't something that you need in life. Like you will find another way to achieve your goals if you have that mindset. You know, 99% of the things in life are just things that you want rather than need. And yep. the moment you can acknowledge that, A, you're setting yourself up to be in a much better position to be poised to go and chase those goals. But B, you're also setting yourself up so that if things don't go exactly to plan, you know, you're in that mindset where you can just boom, cool, okay, it didn't go well, but I didn't need it. I can focus yep. on something else now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that's such a great attitude to have. And um, if we can fast forward a little bit now to, you know, you wake, you, you know, now you're going to be racing for gold. Um, you wake up on the morning. What are some of the thoughts, feelings, emotions of someone who knows they're about to go and race um, for an Olympic gold? And I know it's about, you know, the process and, and you, you really do want it. You don't need it. But what's that like to be at the very highest echelon and, and, and wake up that on the morning of? You're nervous you're definitely nervous but like the thing with what we do is we, we don't we're not comparing ourselves to anyone but ourselves and as far as developing a, a you know, mastering a skill set goes it's relative to to the, the you know to everyone else you, we don't compare ourselves to everyone else we we're literally you know are we better than ourselves yesterday day by day and so you know, we don't feel elevated above anyone else or you don't feel any different you just you're engaged as what you are you're not you're not thinking about really performance as such you're just thinking about going out and repeating everything that you've been doing leading leading into that event like our training was how we were going to race and we had worked out in our training that we we're in a position where we could seize a gold medal and so there was nerves but the nerves were only because you know, I knew it was going to be such a such a big moment. It wasn't nerves for how well I could go because I was confident in how well I could go. Yep. Um, I guess the nerves came because you know I didn't know if the other countries had enough, or you know I didn't know if the other countries would pull out a massive performance and beat us because mm. I knew how fast we could go. I didn't know how fast they could go. That was yep. where my nerves were. Yeah. Yeah. And can you remember much about the race itself? Is it is it a blur or is it something you've you've analysed yeah. over and over again? You know it intimately. How does it? There's, What's your recollections of the race? There's a few points that stand out. One of them was sitting in their starting blocks and thinking, I really want this, but I don't need it. And I was like, that's a weird thought. You know, I'm sitting at, <laughs> at the biggest moment of my life and I'm sitting here going, oh, what happens if I fail? Oh, well, I'll go do something else. You know, like I was like, oh, it'll suck, but I can go do something else in life. And, and that's OK. Um, on the flip side, I was like, you know, I, I would really like this as well. So I'm going to yeah. do my I'm going to do my damn best to, to seize the moment. Yeah. Um, and that's also key, like not running away in that moment. But that was one of them. Another one was coming through the 1K mark. One of my mates, an old Westlake boy, Dan McSweeney, he's 37 now. He, I talked to him the night before the race and he said, man, like, I'm not jealous of how much you've had to train, but I'm jealous of the chance that you're going to go out into an Olympic A final tomorrow and get to have fun and, and you know, do some business in an Olympic final. He's like, when you get to that 1K, you better think of me and you better smile. And I... <laughs> Weirdly, during the race, I, I thought of him and I did actually smile. I remember looking out and going, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're hitting the field here. This is yeah. this is actually pretty cool. Um, a couple more moments like Hamish Bond, the now triple Olympic gold medalist, double at the time. He didn't lose a race for eight years in his pair. Uh, we had 700 metres to go and I remember he made a yell saying, go for gold. And when someone with two Olympic gold medals yells go for gold man like your whole body just gets flooded with adrenaline and your your back starts tingling and all of a sudden you got plus 10 percent strength and you're just throwing yeah. down it's that was awesome yeah and how pivotal I well, just sort of just sidestep the race at a moment how pivotal is it for anyone you know sport aside or not to have someone like would you class him as a mentor or Absolutely. someone who's been there and done it before to lean on Do you, is that something you put a lot of stock in Hundred percent, yeah. That is, without trying to be too cliche and cheesy, mentoring and networking is everything. Like, to boil it down and make it simple, the things that he bought 
were A is experience, B is humility. Like the dude, the dude didn't come in and say, this is how we do things because I know this is what works. Mm. He came in and said things like, this is what's worked for me, let's try it. And then he, and then he stepped back and listened. Yeah. Um, you know, his, the confidence that he brings when we would do, you know, a big week of training and none of us have won Olympic gold medal except Hamish. And he would say, what we're doing is enough. That gives you so much confidence. Yeah. And having that network is just so key. Like in sport, you know, in high performance sport and a lot of you guys, some of you guys will get to experience this and some of you, some of you may not, some of you may not be interested in it, but in sport, you're in an environment where you get a lot of positive feedback. So you get a lot of coaching, you get a lot of reviews. And I'd say you guys are probably in a pretty similar situation at school. When you leave that, you don't naturally get that same level of positive feedback. So in life and in business, and that is where having a good network comes in so key because not only is it your role to give out support and positive feedback to those in your network and those around you, but surround yourself with the right people and they do the same to you. They will build you up and they will get your momentum in life rolling and get you achieving what you want to. Brilliant. Um, yeah, we, we would certainly echo that as a school. You know, we know how important it is to have role models and whether it's older boys or teachers to, to look up to, it's, it's, and it's brilliant that you've validated that for us, Mike. Um, sort of, if we could just sort of jump back on the water and back to that particular race. Yeah. Um, it, was there a point when you knew you had it won or was it, you know, we just, we're not going to stop till we cross the line and... You never know. You never yeah. know when you've won it. You only know when you've won it when you cross the line and the buzzer goes. And even then, some of us, they didn't know. One of our guys, he, he a, there's this good photo of us crossing the line and his glasses had slipped down his face. They were sitting on the end of his nose. And there's this photo of him looking like, Ooh, like he just looks, he looks absolutely lost. And like, he clearly didn't know that we'd won the moment we crossed the line. But, yeah. you know, back to in the race, you just... You know, anything can happen. Anything can happen. And I remember 100 metres to go, one of our guys, he, he caught the water and you, the, the blades can catch the water and kind of slow the boat down. And he caught the water and everyone could feel it. And like the adrenaline boost on that, we go, man, like we're in front, but this could be something that slows us down. You just never know when you've won and you just can't afford to let your foot off the gas. Brilliant. And then you do cross the line it's yours what's that what's that can you can you sum that up what it feels like to something you've wanted um you haven't needed it but you've wanted it for so long um you achieve it you cross that line mm. there's nobody better in the world at that particular thing at that particular moment in in history what's that like that's a hard that is that's a hard one to explain that's a that's a real you know that's that's a, a once in a lifetime experience so I, I wouldn't say I've practiced that well enough to be able to articulate it clearly. Yeah. Um, look, I, I rather than trying to explain what I felt, I'll, I'll share what I what I experienced in the moment, and that was we crossed the line, and I didn't actually look; I just could feel that we'd won the race. And I remember just punching the water next to me. Boom! Water goes up in the air, slap the back of the dude in front of me, and he just spins around and he's starting laughing because he just doesn't know how to react in the moment. So this dude's laughing. We've got guys yelling. We've got nine guys who are all just, it's just uproar as soon as you cross the line. And on top of that, your body's burning. Your lungs are screaming. Your muscles are crying at you to, to stop. And yeah. like, that's everything going on at that moment. It's, it was just amazing. Yeah, I mean, it was for us watching, you know, back in New Zealand, it was, it's it's spine tingling just for us to for someone that we know like someone who sat in our classrooms or sat on our stood on our stage in assembly to to be there in that moment is just so inspiring so um it, i suppose it's not it, it's not westlake's moment but it it feels like when you've got a connection to it and that's part of new zealand i suppose there's so many connections it just it made us so proud and and it's fantastic that we've been able to to sharing that a little bit you know it's 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 brilliant so thank you, you for that yeah it's, you say it's not Westlake's moment but it, it very much is we you know we are only the tip of the pyramid and there's so many levels beneath that that has helped build us to this point that we needed to reach to achieve the olympic gold and and Westlake is firmly tucked into one of those tiers like i spent four years of my you know my four first years in rowing at Westlake, and it's not just those years, but it's the people that I met 
the friends that I made while rowing, the friends that I made at school, and just all of the support from everyone moving forward in the rest of life. Like it's without it, I wouldn't have been able to achieve what I have. Yeah. Like you guys are very much a part of this. <laughs> That's so nice to hear. And I suppose we're we're drawing this to a close in a little bit, Mike. And um, we we probably just want to, if you could articulate this this experience, everything you've learned in the build up, winning. Um, you know, the come down for, you know, two weeks in a hotel afterwards and all yeah. of that. Could you encapsulate that into any sort of advice or yeah. um, tips or things that the boys could really take from this that have really shone out to you? Yeah. So Izzy would have really stolen my point. When he when Izzy Whitley talked to you guys last week, he, he said hard work prevails, right? That was his key message, hard work and efficiency. Um but I want to add to that, and that's before you put in that hard work, be a real student of what you're doing. What you guys are doing at school now is you're learning how to learn. And you know, some of you are getting qualifications to go into university, which is awesome. But the main thing about your years at school is, yeah, you're learning how to learn. And so when you go out into the real world and, and you go on and, and, and live your life and pursue your business dreams or your sporting dreams, Keep being a student, keep looking for areas that you can improve things, keep being aware of what's going on and, and just studying your profession, whatever it may be, because the more you are critical and you analyse your situation, the more options you have available to you. And once you know your options, then you do what Izzy advise and you throw hard work at it and the world is your oyster as soon as you've got those two things. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we're just going to, we're going to give the boys um, just five minutes or so if they want to ask any questions and we'll we'll see them as they come in and whilst they're probably thinking of a few things what's next for you mike what have you got what's coming up what's what's the plan yes. for the future how do you top this that's the big question isn't it the the obvious answer is two olympic gold medals um <laughs> but uh i'm not sure at this point i'm not sure um we this is kind of our break time and we've spent the last five weeks of it either in MIQ or in lockdown. So I'm in Cambridge at the moment, guys. So I'm in level two, which, you know, sorry, sorry to share that with you guys, but I get to get out and about and <laughs> yeah. see my friends now. Um, but hang in tight there. Um, so I think for now it's just going to be mentally decompressing a wee bit. I've spent the last five weeks thinking about things and now it's time to get out. I think I might head down to Ruapehu tonight and get on, get on the slopes tomorrow. But like, you know, work hard, play hard, you've, you've got to be able to switch off. And that's what I'm going to do over the next wee while is I'm just going to switch off. I'm not going to think about sport, I'm not going to think about work unless I really have to. And I'm just going to enjoy myself for a bit. That's so important to enjoy yourself. Yep. Awesome. That's really good. The questions, I, I, the boys are supposed to be um, enjoying hearing from you, Mike. They haven't really asked too many questions. I've just got one in here. Um, was there any big sort of celebrations after the gold medal? How did you, how did you get off the water and just enjoy the moment what did you get up to in the village or what happens after you've won a gold medal i suppose um typically what happens is is you know there there are after parties typically but because of all the COVID restrictions we we did manage to do something as a team we went to a japanese it was a it was a six-star hotel i didn't realize they even had these things apparently they do in tokyo and we got taken into the 47th floor penthouse and we had our whole team in there and we we you know just had a, a couple of beers as the team and i think we had it for about an hour and then we went back to the village it was it was nice it was it was more of just a just a, a chat and debrief and and have a, a a beer together and then yeah get back on the plane brilliant thank you michael i've, I've written three words down as as this has been going on i've written um about you i've written humble i've written tough and I've written inspirational. They're my three things that are, you know, really struck me as as you were talking. Do you have any parting thoughts for the boys as you leave? I mean, they're my three things about you, but do you have anything for them? Um, that's very kind of you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, look, I I think Izzy delivered a really good message to you guys, uh, and also you guys had Richie talk to you recently as well, didn't you? Yeah, Richie Hardcore, yeah, he spoke yeah, maybe yeah, two so weeks you, ago, yeah. You've yeah. had a couple of legends talking to you guys, and you know, those guys, you know, we've all gone on to do different things in life, and, and you know, each, all three of us have, have found, you know, our version of success. And the message that those guys have sent you have been really good. Like, one of Izzy's key take-homes was, you know, find your passion and, and pursue it, and, you know, 
maybe some of the some of the things you're doing at school aren't your calling and that's absolutely okay like falling back on my message what you're doing now is you're learning to learn as soon as you leave school you've got so much time and opportunity to go and pursue what you want that was one of Izzy's messages and I want to I want to reiterate that because I reckon that was really good and then Richie talked a lot about mental health as well which you know it's quite relevant in sport at the moment and in general um and I'll tie that into the messages that I was sharing about networking and community and that's that like you know networking is everything guys like people are everything you use your mates lean on your mates be a good mate yourself like the only thing that you'll have throughout life is is the people around you everything you know your jobs your 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 house your your you know where you're currently at at the moment everything comes and goes if you're in a bad situation now that'll come and go good situation that'll probably come and go as well so what you've got is your network and your mates build a solid network around you use them support them that's 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 the key to happiness boys brilliant thank you and you've certainly done that mike which is and it's been so good to hear from you we want to thank you um not just for this for this talk but you know the work that you put in as a westlaker with our boys particularly the rowing boys and and for the moments you've, you've given us right throughout school but and also being on that podium it, it, like i say and I, I know um you're saying it's partly westlake's moment but we're just so proud of mm -hmm of you and, and what you've achieved and we know you'll go on to do some great things in life whether it's on the water off the water so from all of us at Westlake thank you so much um, we wish you well and it's been brilliant to hear from you awesome thanks Andy and cheers for having me guys thank you thank you very much